Okay, this is um, the next project file in this sequence. It's actually the same project file as the last time, except we've just changed which camera is active, uh, moved the timeline down a little bit. Um, I actually wanna, yeah. To right after that wide, or that close shot ended, we switched over to the wide camera, and this is like from when the bird lays that hot dog in the eggs. And right before they land um or i should say are replaced with their cracked versions um which we'll get into so this is going to have some simulation and along with everything else that we covered in the other two videos uh i'll go over the camera settings really quick they're pretty much exactly the same as the last time except the focal length is a little wider uh and the damp track is on this camera target uh, which is animated we'll get into it in a little bit um, and the influences here are keyframed uh, from the damp track and the copy location because you'll see after a certain point this empty that it's damp track to and copying location from is going to start moving and so we need to be able to like set the influences here dial those in for when that is falling just to like keep everything as smooth as possible you can see there's like a little bit of a zoom in uh nothing super duper fancy but just like a little bit of extra work to like keep everything smooth and like in as few takes as possible to kind of contribute to that handheld feel like mentioned last time this also with the graph editor or with the graph animator which we'll pull up here Um, there's modifiers on the X and Z. Hmm. Okay, so that's the animation for the camera. Pretty simple. Pretty much went over everything else. Now, there's kind of like extra layers to this that it's probably a little m less elegant than it could be, but it kind of got the job done quickly, so it's kind of how I kept things. This camera target that the camera is looking at also has some constraints on both of the two eggs that are falling. These influences start out at zero and kind of flip like a switch towards the end there. Uh, just to kind of like keep it centered on them for when the camera is following them as best as I could. Uh, not perfect, but pretty good. Um, so let's get into the simulation. I guess we'll start with this since it's falling out first. This has a soft body on it. It's already been baked down. There's just a lot of playing with settings. I find that playing with the mass and simulation speed does a lot. I also pulled down the strength and these are my edge settings. I can't, and stiffness too, self-collision. I can't really make any strong suggestions as to what works here. Depending on the scale of your object, the complexity, all these different things are going to like really contribute to the simulation overall, how it looks. So really what it is, is just sitting there for a couple hours and moving things around and seeing what they look like. Eventually you'll get something you like, and that's when you can then bake it. The other complicating factor here for me was getting the speed and simulation of the soft body for this to match with the speed and simulation for these two eggs, which are rigid bodies, which calculates simulation in a different way. For whatever reason, that stuff is calculated here in the rigid body world. That's where you set the speed and that's where you mess with the cache here. Um, it took a lot of playing with these things, especially these two colliders. Um, you know, those are done here. They're, I'll go into this in a second, uh, but things like the collision margin and the shape 
setting the shape to capsule and pulling the collision margins and were kind of the first steps to getting these things to kind of topple the way I was satisfied with and getting the kind of spin as they fall. Uh, the other thing of note is that I added a force and a vortex in here, which if you look at the hot dog, um, I'm pretty sure down here in field weights, I turned the wind off completely because while it was helping me with the eggs, it wasn't helping with the hot dog. So like, I guess my advice is to not be afraid for things to not be realistic. Um, obviously this isn't a realistic simulation. Uh, and just like be aware that you might have to sit here for a while and mess around with settings. Uh, watching videos is a really good way of knowing what those settings do. That's what I did a lot of time. It took me a long time to figure out where these things were living. Because like I said, some of the settings for rigid bodies are here. That's where a lot of the confusion in the scene arrived for me. I don't really like doing simulations in 3D because I don't really like the trial and error nature of it. So sitting here and kind of like learning how to do things was something I haven't done before in Blender. Um, I think another thing that really took me a long way to figure out, as you can see with these eggs, they're starting off small and behind the bird and then they both grow in scale and move before the simulation starts and that getting that uh, order of operations to kind of work was challenging um and the way i did it was by in the rigid body world starting the simulation at 140 which is where it needed to start for um, the hot dog to work. And then with the other setting I had to keyframe in here is in here, whether or not these were animated. So these say that the animated setting kind of overrides any um, physics that are gonna happen. So, but you can keyframe this. So you can say that this is animated up until this keyframe. And then that's when this animation of it scaling and translating stops. And then that's when it picks up. And I think that there is some leftover momentum from the animation. I'm not 100% sure on that, but that's kind of how it feels. But it took a long time of kind of like finding out the order of operations of how these things are calculated because I kept running into problems where like depending on where I had um, set up the animation to start or the simulation to start here and where um, the animation began and ended and other things like the dynamics and forces it was just a lot of moving parts that took me a while to kind of nail down what I needed to be changing and when and what was really making a difference. So I guess my suggestion is if you're beginning to learn how to simulate things in Blender like me and you're mixing keyframed animation with the simulation, um, knowing that this and most of these other settings are keyframable, obviously knowing what they do, that's really important um, and paying attention to that is really important but again it took me like maybe like an evening or two to kind of like get this to a place where i liked and it was a lot of like stopping working watching a video or like reading the documentation before something really happened uh and happened to look the way i wanted it to look um but i'm satisfied with it because there's not a lot of like cuts or having to break it into different project folders um there's a little bit of that but a lot less than i would have expected um what else do we need to go over? I guess that's it for animating these simulations. Um, I guess you can see once you get down to a point here, you can see this is floating in the background. This has its, uh, is visible and render keyframed out. So at this point, it's not visible in the render anymore. And I just put this draped over the edge here. Obviously that's not where it would have landed if it would simulated, but it's just kind of, you know, there to be like this landed before these. It's for the composition. Um, 
Modeling wise, uh, these are really simple. Um, these poles, this is kind of loosely based on a model I found online for free and then a lot of hand modeling to make it work and look better. Um, but really nothing, nothing too crazy going on. Um, you can see there's solidify, mirror, and subdivision. These are just basic cylinders. This is completely lifted from another tutorial that I'll link, so I won't go over that here. Um, this sign is just a subdivided plane with um, a displacement texture on it, which the displace modifier set the strength here. You can set a texture, control that texture here. It's just clouds. Uh, this is basic stuff. There's plenty of other videos that go over this. Uh, what else is modeled and visible in this scene? This plane. We'll go over that when texturing. There's a ground plane. There's this, which this is just, you know, a subdivided and extruded cube for both the top and bottom of this wall. Um, and then these both have bevel modifiers on them just to give it a little bit of roundness on the edges. They're also collisions, so that when the eggs hit it, uh, they'll bounce off of it and not just roll around. Um, there's more modeling for the next video that I will go into later. I think that is all the modeling and animation for now. So let's go back to the camera view and let's get into materials and shading. So I try not to use any text like image textures when I can. Try to stick to what's provided for me in the node editor. So for the fence and the poles and everything, you can see there's this really cheap um, kind of galvanized metal look. It probably doesn't show up the best and isn't my best work, but for something that's just speeding past, it's good enough. Um, by this point, you'll be familiar with the way I have my metal set up with the roughness. The only complicating factor here is I have a Vernoy texture from the color, which gives you this kind of like uh, cracked, broken shell look that's going into a color ramp, which is setting it to gray values. Uh, it's also controlling the roughness, which I don't know if that's physically accurate or not, but hey. Uh, and then that's just going into the base color. So that's a super simple material. It looks all right. Could look better. It looks all right. Um, next is this sign. This is just like shade on Node Editor 101. Uh, really quick and dirty um, sign texture that I made in Photoshop um, with an alpha channel for the edges to make it a little more round. Um, and then that has a noise texture controlling both the quality and placement of rust, which is also being ranged, map ranged to control roughness and to give it a bit of bump. That's that. Super basic. Could look way better. Only going to be on frame for like a couple minutes, so whatever. Uh, the eggs, the eggs, um, not too dissimilar to the clay textures I made, or clay materials I made, I should say. Um, you just have a finer bump on the surface to give it kind of that eggshelly look. Color ramp, also controlled by that bump, some subsurf, uh, and a pretty rough surface. Same thing here with different colors. Last thing that I think, what are they? What? Oh no, there's a couple more things. So let's go back here. Let's get that hot dog. Or actually, let's go to the end. It'll be easier to see there. Really similar, really basic. Roughness setup that I've shown before. Base color, subsurface, and shiny little cartoony wiener. Um, this cartoony cement wall, this is a little more complicated, but step by step, it'll make some sense. Um, 
we're actually in the wrong one. I don't need that. Okay, so Peter's starting to chug a little. Um, let's start here. Okay, so all the way back, we're getting a noise texture. And then this, the vector, is both a mapping node set to the object coordinates, which just give it like a smooth, overall, clean texture coordinate. Mixed in just a little bit is this big noise texture that's just going to warp the coordinates ever so slightly. It's probably not that noticeable. Might not even be necessary here. That's going in here to give the overall porous look. It's a little bit crunched. And then that is controlling the color and the bump. This is the ever-present roughness setup. Um, this is also going into displacement. Um, and the reason I have it going into both bump and displacement, and you'll see bump isn't connected to the BSDF, is because I can use that in this normal node for ambient occlusion to give it a little bit more pop. That's going into a power mode. That's multiplying the color texture. That's giving us this like super inaccurate, but reads as concrete, kind of cartoony, porous concrete look. Um, carried over into this brick texture. It's pretty much the same exact thing. The only difference is it's being put into this brick texture, which is default and blender you set the colors squash scale i won't get into all these settings because if you're interested in making a brick texture this is stuff you'll play around with on your own the only thing is i'm using a little bit of the noise mixed with this mapping node to give a little bit of like wobbly variance to the brick just a little bit um this is the same noise that's going into the concrete texture you see up here. Um, that's going into a bump, which is again going into the ambient occlusion to give it a little more pop. When it goes into the multiply, same roughness setup, displacement the same. Uh, and that just gives us this like displaced, really cartoony brick thing on this box. Um, I kind of sped through that. I really feel like that even though there's a lot of nodes here, it's not that complicated. Um, and if you just spend any amount of time messing around in the shader editor, you'll like be able to achieve something like this. It's really not that impressive, but effective um, pretty quickly. The only other texture left is this little guy back here which is just an image plane with alpha and base color into a principle. Just a little PNG of my friend poking up over the wall. Um, so that's it for rendering and shade, or for shading, I should say, um, and materials and stuff. Um, I guess the next thing to go over is the rendering and compositing settings. Um, I guess it bears mentioning before I forget that going back to animation before you render, if you have everything dialed in you want, you can bake your dynamics and that'll cause the rendering process to go faster because it's not gonna be read. Um, it's not gonna be re-simulating on every frame. Sorry, I did open up a new file that had the right view layers and um, compositor settings in it. Uh, everything else I showed you is exactly the same. Um, these are broken down. There's the fence, which has the fence, lights, camera. That's it. And then fence in front, that has everything that's supposed to be in front of the fence, which is kind of how I get around this simulation, having these eggs and the hot dog go like back and forth through space. Um, 
it, they'll always just appear like they're in front of the things because of the way I've set it up in the compositor, uh, which just simplifies things for me. Uh, there's obviously other ways of doing it that are probably a little more clean, but this is exactly what I needed, so I didn't have to put that much thought into it. Um, okay, so I am going to... Everything else, including like passes and everything, are exactly the same. Uh, so I'm going to go here to 209 uh, and render something out. Actually, let's go here, 195. I'm going to render this out, and we'll take a peek at the compositor. Okay, we're back. Um, you'll see there's really not much different about these settings in placement than the last time. The only real difference is that instead of this layer being called bird, it's fence in front. This is everything that I want to be rendered in front of the chain link fence, which is pretty much everything in the scene. Um, you'll also notice, you might think that because the eggs are falling, they'll have motion blur on them, but since the camera is tracking their path, they're actually going to be uh, not blurry at all and the background is what's going to have blur on it and i could even um add blur to the hdri in the background if i had um, rendered out the um vector but i actually even though that would probably be physically accurate or more physically accurate i i didn't really want that um maybe it would have looked good but whatever um, yeah, other than that, everything is the same. I only really wanted to bring this up because I wanted to note that this path isn't just the bird, it's fence in front. And the main reason I did things like this is just so I wouldn't have to worry about the eggs potentially moving behind or in front of the fence or hitting the fence if I put a collider on the fence with the simulation. I really just wanted them to like be in front of it the whole time and because of that I was able to use this kind of fakery uh, with just having two different uh, view you know view layers but when we get further on you'll notice that um, we're gonna have to make a cut and change some of those things I think in the next the next video uh, so it's just kind of worth bringing up now that that's the way this is set up. That's the way I plan for it to be set up. Um, and even though it's probably not the most elegant way things could be set up, it's quick and dirty and it worked for what I needed it to be. Um, and as you can also see that because there's so much more going on in the scene, especially with this high poly chain link fence, um, it's starting to take a long time to composite. So going forward, we might not be sticking around in the compositor view as much. I might just be going over like, da 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 da. This is how this stuff is laid out and moving on. Because I've already shown you what these nodes do, and those are really the only nodes we're using for the rest of the project. So, all right, that is it. Thanks for sticking with it. If you did, I know these have been rambly or whatever, but thanks for sticking with it. Um, and the next one will be going over the X breaking.